Our third survey of murals of India on DVD is a focus on the Nayaka period and the various Nayaka styles that emerged both in Tamil Nadu and in Karnataka, that is, following the breakup of the Vijaya Nagara Empire, the Nayaka period. In the first part, we'll look at murals in four temples with a Madurai or Madura style in Tamil Nadu, three Hindu and one Jain, and in a palace, a style which lasted only 70 years. Then we'll focus on Karnataka, where two temples, a palace, and a Jain monastery have rather different styles of Nayaka art. At this Jain monastery, I'll read a wonderful description by an ancient king of how the dry fresco murals were prepared and made. The Nayaks were military generals appointed by the Vijayanagar kings to administer the vast territory of the empire. When Vijayanagara power was decimated in 1565, the Nayak generals became autonomous, ruling most of Tamil land through the 1700s. So the style is diverse, with some artists continuing the royal tradition and other untrained artists doing their own thing as folk art, as we see here all in different areas, but all done under Nayak rulers. The styles seem rather devolved from the glories of the more fluid traditions, more and more stylized, compartmentalized, stronger colors. We'll begin at two Nayaka mural sites in Tamil Nadu, a Shiva temple in Tirupudai Marudur, which is a small village in the far south of Tamil Nadu, and the very famous Shiva Nataraja Temple in Chidambaram, just south of Puducherry. Tirupudai Marudur in the Tirunel Valley district is a Shiva temple dating from the 500s, but the murals date a thousand years later on. The temple tower has five tiers and that's where the murals are, so that mostly no one can easily see them and they are quite well preserved. There are 30 walls like this, all in the first tier of the temple tower a most unusual style or styles just on the periphery in the south in a way of Nayaka art. Lots of rows of characters, lots of stories told. The mural is over six and a half meters long by nearly three meters high. That's 22 feet by nine and a half feet. So these are storytelling panels rather like film strips needing a priest or scholar to interpret of course. So here are a few close-ups to give a sense of the very folksy, rather cartoon-like style. Strangely, most of the art revolves around Vishnu stories instead of Shiva. The lion-headed god is green, Narasimha, the lion incarnation of Vishnu. Green color shows his sattvic nature, noble and divine. Many scenes depict Tamil literature and myth, so this art is, in a way, portraying the Tamil culture and art of the big temple at Tanjore that we saw before. Foliage is used as a fill-in and rather abstracted. Rama in blue-green checking his arrow, very sattvic. In some areas the background is painted red, but the white plaster is left as a thick outline or highlight around most figures. A procession of music players, dark-skinned here, Tomasic characters traditionally of lower caste. We notice the pop-out eye again a blue-gray background with white outline again. A warrior has just got a spear through his arm. His skin is red since a warrior would have a rajasic character, powerful or wealthy. Red and white highlighting on a gray background. Another red rajasic warrior on an elephant. Rather caricatures of warriors. Sometimes the artist introduced some comic elements. Here, pre-war negotiations are being discussed in the king's court. Realizing that they are headed nowhere, one man, mostly in white here, with his eyes looking at the diplomats to the left, steps forward, stamping on the war elephant's foot, and the elephant in turn steps backward on the horse's foot, and so on, sparking off a comedy of errors of sorts. Here's a Portuguese ship arriving with Portuguese horsemen and traders. This means the west coast, south of Portuguese Goa, established in 1498 as a trading center. Many colors are used here. The ocean, as we see, is mostly fish. 
painted in four panels, but I've put them together here. Notice the red highlighted horse detail upper right. Here it is. Rather curious use of greens and reds for the European clothes, not Indian clothes at all. There are many historical and mythic images from the temple walls which still need decoding, as this temple is still in one of the more remote areas today. It can be called Frontier Nayaka painting. Frontier. Finally, in this computer-enhanced version, Vishnu rests on the snake Sesha, and over on the right, Rama is above with nine avatars of Vishnu down below, from Matsya the fish to Kalki the white horse. Cartoonish, we might say. Many of the artistic themes seem closer to the neighboring styles of Kerala, which we'll see in the next DVD. Tirupudai Marudur. So we come to Chidambaram, the great Nataraja temple. Several very large and complex Nayaka murals in the Madura style remain here in this fantastic temple complex, dating to the 1600s. It's in the Chitsaba, the Hall of Consciousness of the Kama Sundari Shrine. In the ceiling it is, and fairly well preserved. Most of these will be my photos. But here the stories are seen in shorter panels, running crossways in the long ceiling, not lengthwise as we've seen before, like short film strips, and that's the way they would be narrated. Shiva Nataraja appears often within circles, as at the top here, and there are several areas where the paint has fallen off, rather common with the fresco secco technique as used here. The stone surfaces were plastered in two layers and then finished with very fine plaster. And the painting was done after the plaster dried, of course. The brushes used here were probably bristles made from banyan roots. The figures are heavily ornamented with rather elaborate hairstyles. The trees and foliage were kept simple and the background minimal, not really landscape, however. Both ochre backgrounds and cream backgrounds are used as well as strong compartmentalization. Bright vegetable and mineral colors along with vegetable gum for binding made the tempura paint. Nayaka colors were typically very vivid, far from the subtleties of earlier centuries. There are many Shiva stories illustrated here, but we'll just go with one, a rather racy story actually, with Vishnu appearing as a naked dancing woman. Shiva appears twice here, white and four-armed, in his form as a naked beggar, Vikshatana. But his fine body enchants the women of the village and they begin to take their clothes off. They become naked ladies. In response, the holy rishis are upset as their wives too have fallen to Shiva's charms. So they planned a sacrificial fire to try to magically destroy Shiva. Then Vishnu suddenly appears as a beautiful woman called Mohini who dances naked in front of the rishis to tr try to distract them from their rituals. So Mohini becomes Shiva's consort as a sport. Then the rishis get excited and get naked too at the right and head toward her quite erect. And the lower area here, the distracted rishis are unable to finish their sacrifice against Shiva and instead demon animals are released from the sacrificial fire, bottom center demons rising, including snakes and a tiger, but Shiva accepts them all, simply wearing them as his ornaments and for his clothing. Then Shiva performed his great dance, the Tandava, the dance of eternal bliss, and disclosed his true form. The rishis have to surrender, realizing what Lord Shiva stands for, and that he is beyond their magic and rituals. The great Nataraja temple at Chidambaram. We go next, north of Pondicherry, to Rupa Ruti Kamran, near Kanchipuram, and Tanjvur to the south. Tirupa Ruti Kamram Jain Temple, again. In the second DVD on murals, we saw a few images at this temple dating from the Vijaya Nagara era, most of them gone but there are some others from the early 1700s painted during these Nayaka times. The murals concern the life of Tirtankara 
Vardhyamana, who became Mahavira, the last Jain saint. Mahavira sits naked here on a stone in the forest with his also naked brothers-in-law who observe him in his act of penance, that is, trying to stop all bodily activity by fasting. He looks the other way. His relatives and other friends were unable to bear the prince's total fasting and began knocking down fruit from trees for him to eat. Again, he pays them no attention. Divisions are made by abstract trees here. Fewer colors are used here than at Chidamram, and they are fully Jain in style. Western Indian style, it has been called as well. A pair of Mahavira's brothers came to the forest to demand their share of the kingdom that the prince had given away when he had renounced the world. Their servants bring him offerings of food at the left, but the brothers are rejected by him at the right. In another area, Prince Sriyan Kumar lies in the center, dreaming, supposedly, of all the auspicious signs and images of Jain gods and goddesses symbolized here at the right and at the left. The scenes are drawn in different segments, indicating time sequences of the story and are meant to be narrated. There are many parts of the complicated tale and many more images. In a central ceiling mandala, Mahavira sits on a golden throne and under a small parasol. Indra, king of the gods, is behind him on both sides. Two Indras, actually. Typical Jain style is here. Great angularity of line, panels or compartments, symbolic and rather caricatured figures, and just a very few bright colors, red, gold, and a bit of bluish green. We come again to Tanjvur at the Brihadeshvara temple, usually called the Big Temple, constructed in a new, very Tamil style of architecture, Dravidian, during the Chola era by 1010 by Raja Raja Chola I. That's him behind his guru, Chola Art. Some of the best murals are on walls behind rows of lingams and all seen as icons for worshipping. It's art done for the Nayaka rulers who were Maratha of the Maratha Tamil lineage. They are behind wooden fencing, which can partly slide open. After the fall of the Vijaya Nagara Empire, many philosophers, writers, musicians, and artists migrated to other neighboring kingdoms like Tanjavur and to Mysore, where they could find support. So Tanjavur paintings show a syncretic style which assimilated other contemporary influences. Tamil, Telugu, Maratha, European, Deccani, even folk. They are characterized by rich, flat, vivid colors with simple iconic compositions, all done on dry lime plaster. Essentially serving as devotional icons, the subjects of most paintings are Hindu gods, goddesses, and saints, but some historical battles won by the Nayaka rulers are shown as well. Episodes from Hindu Puranas and other religious texts were visualized, sketched, and painted with a main figure or figures placed in the central section of the picture. Shiva's face symbolically placed. A well-preserved panel has Shiva and Parvati riding on Nandi. Shiva's bull, with worshippers fanning them with fly whisks. Main deities are shown frontally, others in profile. Very Jain originally. Saraswati play. This is a painting style that evolved here in Tanjavur by artists under the local Nayaka rulers called the Tanjavur style. It became the most influential branch of the general Madura style. Tanjavur style. Deeper inside the temple are more wall murals seen within architecturally defined spaces as we see here and surrounded by subsidiary figures, themes, and subjects. There's a very strong focus on Tamil myth and literature here, more than in many other temples, with the art showing more folk elements. This likely portrays a local religious story. Very folk and influence here too. A mural showing Ganesh on his mouse, Saraswati on her peacock, both headed left, and worshippers and Shiva on a grand couch at the right. 
This is the temple where many Nayaka paintings had been placed over the early Chola ones near the inner sanctum. They have been removed by the Archaeological Survey of India and put in a separate pavilion nearby. They used, as reported, a unique de stucco process for the first time in the world and restored 16 Nayaka paintings which had been superimposed on the thousand-year-old Chola frescoes. And they were placed onto fiberglass boards, as we see here. This is Tri Purantaka, prepared to destroy three mythical cities of the Asuras. He holds a sword, a deer, and a bow and arrow in his four hands. Most of these inner paintings became very hazy from centuries of incense. So there are a variety of substyles of the Tanjavur style mural art of the Nayakas, as we've been seeing, some more polished than others. They were probably created by different artists who came from different parts of the Vijayanagara Empire. Some are simple with heavy lines and some lyrical with a feeling of movement. And some more refined with well-studied facial expressions. The Maratha style or Madhura style, but now it's usually called Tanjavur style. Nearby is the Grand Palace of Tanjavur, built during the Nayaka dynasties in the 16th and 17th centuries with its tall armory and highly vaulted Durbar Hall for the Maratha ruler Sarfoji II to give darshan and hold audience. It's a vast building complex organized around a series of courtyards. The Grand Durbar Hall is heavily ornamented, as we see, with most everything carved and painted, both outside and within. A rather spectacular display of colors. The Durbar, where the ruler would sit, is very central, now seen with a painting of Sar Foji. The ornamentation above is quite amazing. Even the pillars and arches and ceilings are decorated with scenes from Hindu epics, mostly Vishnu-related images. Sarfoji himself commissioned this art, mostly religious. Sarfoji II himself, a mural placed where he would hold audience, Durbar. Many of the original murals on dry plaster are in poor condition, likely Krishna here. The best preserved murals are up high, a royal palace scene with Krishna and his wives. Not Krishna with the gopis in Gokula or Brindaban, but royal Krishna. Krishna is king, with his queens Rukmini and Satyabhama at Dwarka, his divine palace. People of the kingdom, I suppose, could equate Sarfoji's royalty with that of Krishna. Now there are some good close-ups of this large mural. The very bright colors used, covering all surfaces, show influence originally from Jain art. The four-armed guardian warriors seem to be dancing as they float and fabrics fly, much like Shiva Nataraja in a way. And above them all are the angelic beings fat, childlike ones with wings, some carrying trumpets of some kind. This imagery began in Christian Europe originally, then taken into Persia and finally to India. Cherubic angels, pretty far from the flying Apsars of Ajanta. These are painted in a royal style, certainly not folk, but still supported by the Nayak king, that is, the Maratha king, Sarfoji II, in the Tanjur style. Abstraction, symbolism, and simplification became the rule, and all services ornamented. So in Tamil Nadu, Nayaka period murals still exist at 35 temple sites, but neglect has taken its toll on most all of them. The worst are ceilings, of course. Later, murals in Tamil temples and palaces remained highly stylized and quite static, mainly to instruct and less tonal and more sharply linear. Jain influence there too. We come now to Karnataka, but still the Nayaka era. Some artists of the collapsed Vijayanagara Empire 
went here to find patronage. First will be Sibi, a small village today just northwest of Bangalore on the highway toward Pune. Sibi and Sibi style. The temple's tower of the 1600s is dedicated to Vishnu's lion-headed form, Narasimha. The murals date much later, the early 1800s. Karnataka had shifted from Hindi rule to Muslim rule after powerful leaders like Hyder Ali and Tipu Sultan came to occupy most of Karnataka. So it's fairly notable that during such a period a Hindu temple with rich paintings was constructed and supported by Muslim patronage. The temple itself is quite simple, but the paintings inside are abundant and rather extraordinary. Those on the walls are poor, but those on ceilings have been well protected from weather conditions and vandalism. The first images are from the internet. Some paintings are religious, some historical. The architect and builder of the Sibi temple was Nalapa, here seated higher than his brothers who assisted. He was the revenue officer of Mysore's Muslim ruler then, Tipu Sultan. Nalapa wrote a biography of the Sultan's father, the late Hyder Ali, who was the first powerful Muslim ruler of Mysore. Interesting to see contemporary scenes, dress, and costumes. The tradition of mural art in Karnataka has now lost its aesthetic importance, becoming decorative and folkish. The image at the right is actually more like this. Hyder Ali relaxes on a chair while son Tipu sits on the floor to the right. So the murals of Sibi are not of the refined character that we came across at Hampi. We'll see more refined ones soon in Tipu's later palace at Sri Rangan Patnam. Scenes and icons of Hindu mythology, all quite stylized and very folk in feeling, likely done by very untrained painters. This is about as clear as some of the murals here get. Borders are of course in the Jain style. Arjuna, Krishna, the great battle of the Mahabharata. There are a few panels showing animals in their natural habitat, most likely from a different artist. Tipu in the center shoots a tiger with a musket. Full landscape scenery finally, even if abstracted. Tipu Sultan later became known as the Tiger of Mysore. A bit of painted delicacy and softness here. Tipu attacks a tiger with a sword in his right hand while he stabs a boar with a spear in his left hand as he stamps a venomous snake to death with his left foot. Very complicated. The Sultan must have been a very chivalrous and brave hunter. The Narasimha Hindu temple at Sibi, supported by a Muslim Sultan, Tipu himself, the Tiger of Mysore. Our next and last murals in this state at Shravana Balagola and at Sri Rangapatna, southwest of Bangalore. Shravana Balagola Jain Mata. It became a major Jain center from 981 when a statue of Lord Gomateshwara was carved and has become the most prominent Jain pilgrimage center in Karnataka. The Gomateshwara statue is seven and a half meters tall, 58 feet high, built on top of a hill, considered the largest monolithic statue in Asia. The Jain saint had stood in austere silence so long that vines climbed up his legs and naked body, as the story goes. Daily worship at his feet, as I saw it. Beginning in the 1100s, a shrine temple and nine other temples for worship were built, and a Jain monastery too, up to the 1600s. The monastery here is at the base of the hill, and it has the very best Jain murals of the entire Nayaka period, probably done soon after the middle 1700s. These paintings tell many tales and subtales from Jain literature mostly glorifying the life of one of the greatest of Jain saints, Parshavnath. He likely was a real historic figure. This is very Jain in the partitioning, the lines, the muted colors, a lively mixture of folk and classical, pictorial elements. 
the marriage of Princess Vama, who became his mother eventually. So similar to the Shiva and Parvati's wedding that we saw at Hampi, in its architecture, the ornamentation, the headdresses and crowns, and the tree in the center, an art clearly inherited from Vijaya Nagara. Queen Vama brings in her newborn son to be blessed by the god Indra, and then she gives him to Indra sitting on his elephant, Sachi. Strong colors like Vijaya Nagara art. More accomplished art than at Sibi. As an adult, Parshavnath became the prince of Varanasi, but at age 30, seen here, he renounces his title and begins meditating doing austerities in the forest as a monk. Worshippers come to him and warriors threaten him. After meditating for 84 days, he attains supreme knowledge. Even a tiger tries to scare him, but he remains calm and resolute in his practice. Some good landscape scenery, animals painted in cells with different colored backgrounds, very stylistic and rather cute and he finally achieved liberation at age 100. The previous lives of Parvashnath are illustrated too. Here is Morabuta, who was a general in a king's army. The king had died and the people invite him to assume the throne, even though he had an older brother, Kamat, who became very jealous. So in a forest, this angry and evil brother raises here a huge stone and, down to the right, he throws it, killing his brother Marabuta. Kamath then was executed as a criminal. It's hierarchical with the important people in the story drawn as the largest. But the close-up of the forest is more interesting. Religious practices, yogic postures, austerities, metaphysical discussions going on, each in little compartments or cells, even the trees. A huge amount of fairly well-preserved images here. A contemporary king in grandeur on his elephant, Bharatesha. But for the next ten images, I want to read a more ancient king's amazing description of preparing drywalls for painted murals, called Painting Techniques, by King Somadeva, 1131. The techniques were probably continued for many centuries here in Karnataka. The following images are very complex, but many show the coronation of young Parshavnath and his many processions as a prince, and his warriors and other princes, even some marketplace scenes with commoners. To prepare the wall for painting, the king wrote, first smooth it down well, fill it in all the cracks and then plaster it. The plaster is prepared in the following fashion. Find the fresh hide of a buffalo. Soak it in water until it becomes soft and malleable like fresh butter. When this has been achieved, cut the skin into strips, which are carefully dried then until they are hard. This is a glue and is generally recommended for wall paintings. Then pour water into an earthenware pot and heat the skin which will turn into a liquid when mixed with any color. Take some white clay and mix it with a glue, plastering the wall, which must be very dry, and do it three times. Powdered conch shell and sugar is then added to the plaster and applied to the wall to make it very smooth. The material, known as naga, which comes from Nilgiri, is as white as the moon. It must be ground fine with stones and mixed with the plaster as well. The plaster is applied by hand, gently, very slowly, in order to achieve the maximum smoothness. This done, the painter then may trace onto the wall his brightly colored design, complete with varied expressions and emotive flavors, drawn with style and with the appropriate nuances. Then black soot is pounded with boiled rice and a stick is made from it about the size of the middle finger. With this object, called a chalk, the drawing is done. Take some hair from a calf's ear, fix it carefully onto the end of a reed, fixing it with lacquer. 
This is what is called a brush. Coarse, medium, and fine brushes. The priming, plastering, and sizing is done with a coarse brush and applied on the slant. The design is sketched in with a medium brush, holding the end to one side. With a fine brush, the skilled painter adds his delicate details using the very tip. The expert painter should be able to draw on the wall exactly the same picture which he has composed in his mind. So this interesting mural technique was written by a king and was likely still used up to the 1700s at this Jain monastery and even later. Finally now there's the great Parshavnath when he attained perfect knowledge. An iconographic circle with him meditating in the center. A mandala with the stories of his life all around. No other wall murals in Karnataka come even close to achieving the expression of these at Shravana Balagola. Sri Ranga Patnam, Darya Dalit Bagh, just 16 kilometers from the center of Mysore. Sri Ranga Patnam means the city of Lord Ranga, that's Lord Vishnu. Both a palace and a very near temple have some good Nayaka murals. The last two small sets of images for us. Darya Dalat Bagh and Palace was Tipu Sultan's summer palace set within a garden. The murals date from 1784 when he built it. One wall has paintings in five rows representing scenes of Durbars, audiences of different contemporaries of Tipu. All available space on the walls and pillars and canopies and arches have colorful frescoes in the style of Mysore paintings. Darya Dalit Bagh means Garden of Wealth. Although we saw some very amateurish images of Tipu in the little Narasimha temple at Sibi, this palace art is quite refined. Such incredible detail. The outer walls have frescoes of famous battle scenes. Some depict the armies led by Hyder Ali and Tipu Sultan going into various battles. Some show the English army besieged by his troops. And victory celebrations which were achieved by them, having defeated the English in 1780. And even French soldiers looking through a telescope at the defeat of the English. All to glorify Tipu Sultan, of course. One panel shows the Nizam of Hyderabad and his army of horsemen and elephants arriving a little too late to help his allies, the English. Most compositions are quite formal, even static, without any combat or ferocity to be seen. The Islamic influence of including more landscape details is clear. Persian, actually. Some scenes on these outer walls may have been done in the earlier middle 1800s after the British had killed Tipu in 1799 and finally conquered his army in 1804. On the inner walls there is more cultural and religious scenes portrayed. We see the call to prayer at a mosque. The Muslims here were Shiite with connections with Shiite Persia, not Sunite, not Mughal as in North India. And last is a discussion among the Islamic scholars in the garden of the mosque. Very white marble, Muslim architecture, and tall Persian chinar trees. Finally, a couple last images at the Hindu Prasanna Venkat Ramana temple, nearby Tipu Summer Palace. This small temple was built sometimes in the 1800s by a priest of the royal house then. Most of the murals were destroyed by incense, but a room on the terrace above has still a few visible. We can make out Tipu Sultan, possibly, on horseback, neatly spearing a tiger. There's Krishna up in a tree, having stolen the clothes of the gopis, and down below baby Krishna, lightly floating on a leaf on the Jamna River. Sita's Swayamvara the choosing of a husband, Rama for sure. Very folk-like art, huge eyes make him look very childish in a way. Strong red backgrounds done on wooden panels. Bright colors show the enduring Jain influence. 
And our last image here, Krishna shooting lots of arrows at the same time while riding on, well, quite an elephant. It's called Kunjara Kamini, which means desirable elephant. Of course, it is Krishna's desiring beautiful ladies, and he has as many arrows ready. The Nayaka murals. We have seen that this art varied greatly, from royal and formal, created by highly trained painters with much experience, to very folksy and imaginative works by largely amateurish artists. It's a great diversity of styles, really. It's not really an art period, as the Ajanta style was. This Nayaka period of time, the mid-1500s to the mid-1800s, has only a political consistency in the mind of historians, because many different Nayaka rulers controlled kingdoms in Tamil Nadu and Karnataka. No Nayaka style as such. Only in the Jain art that we have seen is there some consistency in composition, emphasis on borders and on cells or compartments, the protruding eye and long dark beard, angularity of lines, symbolic and rather caricatured figures, and muted colors early on and stronger brighter colors later on. So generally there seems to be a Jain style that evolved, but it spread and influenced Hindu art greatly. Most of the various Nayaka mural styles that we have seen did not continue very much, with the big exception of Tanjavur. The Tamil Madhura style is still mostly known as the Tanjavur style, still repeated greatly in many portable art forms. It originated in the Marathas courts of Tanjavur beginning in the late 1600s up to the mid 1800s. Tanjavur paintings are characterized by rich, flat, and rather vivid colors, simple, iconic composition, glittering gold foils overlaid on delicate but extensive gesso work, and inlay of glass beads or sometimes precious and semi-precious gems, devotional icons mainly of Hindu gods, goddesses, and saints. Our next DVD on murals highlights the Chera style of Kerala. Spaces all filled in in elegant royal fashion with flamboyant colors might be the catchphrase here. There are murals beginning in 1691 in eight different temples in three districts of Kerala, then in three wooden palaces, one in Cochin and two in the far south, and finally Nataraja murals created up to the mid-1800s in five Nataraja temples, a fairly unified Chera style.